right? Yeah, so there's three aspects that I have difficulty with. I think that the pace of, of the process of the application is extremely slow still in the state. Uh, I think it's still... A lot, of, a lot of improvements, though. There has been improvements, but still, uh, last year, over 5,000 people took well over two years for their application to be processed. 1,000 people it took over three years to have their application processed. And this is the first decision. This doesn't include uh, the appeals. And, and I know, for example, last year, there's still a person who was waiting six years for their first application to be processed. So that means that the, there is a, a, a significant number of people in the country who the state has to provide accommodation for who may not actually uh, be successful in the long term in their application uh, for asylum here. Uh, and it, it means that we have to provide more accommodation to uh, accommodate those individuals within the system itself. How do you address that point, Barry, that the system is, is still, despite improvements, too slow? Well, it'll always be too slow. You cannot process the application there unless there are certain elements of this that involve fair, fair procedures and it will take time. But what I think is important is, I think over the last decade or so, we have had huge delays in this, but there's an investment since 2002 of over a 95% increase in staff. So now we're over 400 people uh, working in the International Protection Office. They have now cut those waiting times down. And, and while you might be able to find isolated cases, the reality is that the time for the average time for processing an application has gone from four years to one. And in fact, this year it's anticipated that it'll be closer to six months. So it's more than just improvements. It's a it's a sea change in terms of the way they're dealt with, and it's much much faster. But of course, there are still people who are the tail end of that, but they will be flushed out. Around the way. Can we talk about deportation? Um, Heather, I know you asked a question, didn't you? A parliamentary question on this. 800 deportation orders last year, and how many were deported? Yeah, so I think it was about 33 in the, the question that I received from the okay. governments that have, were actually physically deported by the state. And what do you want to happen? Do you want the guards escorting 800 people out of the country? So this is one of the biggest problems of the government's policy, to be honest. This is, most people can't understand how the, the majority of deportations in the state is a voluntary system uh, in the state. Uh, it's an incredible because it, it, it really damages the integrity of the government's process from start to finish. So over the last five years, only 15% of the deportations have been uh, confirmed by the government. So I've asked the minister, what about the rest? She said that there are voluntary deportations. And I said, do you have any system to confirm at the ports that these people have left? And she said, no, there is no confirmation system at the airports or at the ferry ports to confirm that these people have left. So you're that not is... looking for, for the guards to escort people. You're saying we need to have an eye on the numbers. We need to be checking whether the people who've been told, no, you can't stay here, are actually leaving. That's what at you're asking. At the very limit, at the very base of this, we need to be able to confirm that people are leaving. And we can't confirm that, that is the case at the moment. And the fact that, you know, the, the, the minister uh, has given a, an amnesty to 8,000 uh, undocumented migrants in the country shows that there are many undocumented migrants in the country who are simply not leaving after the process is over. And given the crisis that we have in accommodation, given the capacity issues, it's just startling that the government cannot get it together to confirm when a person leaves the country. Okay, that seems like a fairly reasonable ask, Barry, that we would know that the people who have been refused asylum are actually leaving. Yeah, well, first of all, Pallor mentioned the figure of 857 deportation orders last year. In fact, only 765 of them related to failed international protection applicants. But can I just clarify, a deportation order is simply a notice that you no longer have leave to remain in the state. You can't stay, you must go. That's what it is. And I think a, a, a fair comparison might be, let's say, to a planning enforcement notice. You build an extension on your house in breach of planning conditions. The council doesn't arrive at your house with a bulldozer to knock it down. The first thing they do is they send you a notice saying that is a breach of your planning, you need to remove it. If you don't remove it, then the council or the authority will take action. But this is Paddle's point. That check that is, is not what, happening. Well, that's what I'm going to because come we to. don't have if a system. You heard what Daniel said there about how difficult it is to live here under the radar as a, an undocumented person. Uh, I think it's harder, and it, there's lots of evidence that suggests it's harder in a country like Ireland than it is in most larger countries because we're a smaller community. So living under the radar is hard. The GNIB, the Garda National Bureau, Immigration Bureau, which has responsibility for deportations, did a test over a, a number of cases in the last year, and they are satisfied that the vast majority of people have left the state. But what PAD is looking for is a situation where people somehow must record that they've left, when in fact we have an open border with Northern Ireland. Uh, most people will go over the border, they will leave the country, and the reality is the GNIB who are responsible are satisfied that most of those people have Heather? left. On two points on that, um, first of all, we had that a shocking situation where people were being smuggled into the country there in Russell Air just very recently. Thankfully, a, a horrendous situation was averted when they brought their attention to 
and the authorities. But of those 14 people who came, eight of those people then left and uh, fled the authorities' uh, uh, situation. So even that sample shows you that the, the, the Guardi themselves are not really in control of, of the figures on that. But, you know, this is a good point about the North of Ireland because it's, it's, again, it's a question that we've asked over and over again. The government currently have a system whereby 76% of people who apply for asylum in the state don't apply at an airport, don't apply at a ferry port. They apply now at the International Protection Office. And when I asked the minister, how did they get into the country? She says she doesn't know. And she even went as far as to say she doesn't even ask them at that office when they apply how they came into the country. Now again... Will you explain to people why that's so important? I think that's startling because it means we don't know how people are coming into the country. And we need to know because we need to know how many people are being smuggled. We need to know how many people are being trafficked. We also know, need to know how many people are coming from Britain via the north of Ireland. We need to know how many people are coming in. Maybe from, they have, may have come to the country with a holiday visa or a working visa. Those visas may have expired. And now they're looking for a to apply for asylum. How can you manage a system if you're not even measuring what's going on in the system? And the minister herself says in a parliamentary question to me, she says they're not even asking 76% of the people who came in last year how they came into the state. What? Why? Can you understand why we wouldn't ask that well, question? The first thing is, if somebody is staying here illegally at, or after an expired work or holiday visa, we do know how they come into the system. And it's not the case that there's not monitoring. There is monitoring. You can ask that question. I wouldn't have any difficulty with it being added to the international protection application process to ask the question as to how somebody came here. But it's not a reliable statistic because you don't know whether they're going to tell you the truth or not. Um, but it is not the case because Padua would set out this narrative that there's a free flow and nobody knows what's happening. And that's not the case. In fact, there is very good control and the system actually works very well because the purpose of the International Protection Office and the application system is to, for people to apply for international protection for their applications to be processed and decision, a decision to be made. Not only is that happening, but it's now happening quicker than it ever happened. Can, can I ask you about people who, who decide to stay here illegally when they have been refused on appeal permission to stay in this country? Are you suggesting that they can have a full and productive life in Ireland under those circumstances, Pamela? No, I, I, listen, I, I don't envy anybody in, in those circumstances. It's a disaster situation. Sure, Irish people have spent, you know, decades in the States undocumented, unable to return home for parents, funerals, etc. It's a shocking situation to be in. But, but you a, say it's happening. It's a situation the government's allowing to happen. And the idea that we, there's no point in even asking people because they might lie. Yeah, but the, the inference was that we, even if you ask people, they might lie. That was exactly what was said. And it is a nonsense to say that we don't even ask people because they might lie. It's really important we know how people come into the country. And the way you solve that actually is you make sure that they apply for asylum at the airport and at the ports. Because then everybody else who hasn't applied at those locations has either come into the north, has been smuggled in, or has come in uh, on an expired visa. And then you'll be able to deal with that cohort in a different way, in a, in a way that's more appropriate in finding out the truth. How do you deal with people who are coming in via Northern Ireland? And well, what do you do? And, and are we really going to go back to having a conversation about a border here? No, no, I'm a, I'm a United Irelander, as you know yourself. There's no way I tolerate a border uh, in Ireland. But, but I don't know how else you would have deal a, with it. We have a border between Ireland and Britain for sausages now at the moment. And the European Union and Britain have agreed to that. Mm -hmm. Now, the idea that we can't, we can't have a border for smuggled people coming into the country or trafficking people coming into the country is illogical. Okay, the DUP are not going to agree hey, well, with Well, I was this. just going to say for the sure. DUP would be very unhappy with you for suggesting this. For, for sure, but let, listen, I think the European Union and the British government and the Irish government realise that the DUP cannot block a, a, an Irish sea border for products. So I think, you know, and it's in Britain's interest also to have an integrity to their system. And I think the Irish government should start to work with our London counterparts to make sure that we have that process, that we know who's coming onto the island. Very. Well, again, Pat is suggesting that there are all these people who are being trafficked into the country because, I think, for a fun place, under somebody saying, because there aren't border checks. Now, the alternative, I, I agree with them, I also don't want to see a border between um, Ireland and, and the North. If you want to get a bus from Belfast to Dublin, there should be no restriction on doing that. But if you want to start to monitor people coming into the country, the reality is what you will end up doing is, is uh, racially profiling people, and that has happened in the past as they come over the border. And it's very important that we don't go down that road. But I think Pallor is creating a problem where there is none here. As I said, the, the, the process is working insofar as people who make the application are processed in, the, in accordance with the rules that are set down, both in Irish law and international law. That processing is happening. It's successful. Decisions are made. If you're unsuccessful, you're you have yeah, to leave. If you aren't, you get to stay. You're creating state. a problem where there isn't one. We're just uh, on, on the issue of traffic. Now, I don't want to uh, conflate trafficking and smuggling of people because they are different, uh, etc. 
But Ireland is on a watch list uh, currently uh, in relation to trafficking. Uh, the US State Department saying Ireland is not doing what's necessary to tackle trafficking. There was a thousand uh, court cases over the last 10 years in terms of trafficking in this country, only three convictions. I have never seen a conviction rate as low in any other form of, of crime as there is in trafficking at the moment in this country. So this government is extremely poor in relation to protecting people. And it, it's also uh, relates to the, the people themselves uh, who are being trafficked. I, I just, just want to go back to Daniel's figures, because if we were hugely attractive uh, as a place for asylum seekers to come and to stay, would we not see more coming? Because just going back on his 2022 to 23 figures, 140,000 in total coming in here, 60,000 of whom were Irish, EU or UK, 30,000 on work permits, and just 13,000 were international protection applicants. See, our policy is one of compassion and one of common sense. We understand in this country that there is a difficulty with, with uh, capacity at the moment. But, you know, there's 600 people in tents on our streets currently. There are 5,000 people in, true, no. in, in, there's 5,000 people in, uh, deep, in, in direct provision centres who have actually been regularised but can't leave those areas. The Taoiseach himself has stated in, in the last week that he seeks to potentially spend money in future so that people don't have to be brought into this country because of capacity issues. So all we're saying is, let's make the system properly efficient and effective and and be able to differentiate between those who need help and those but who don't. But are you saying that the system as it currently stands is attractive to people to come here? You're going to be in emergency accommodation and getting 38 euro a week. I'm saying that the system doesn't efficiently and effectively differentiate between those who need help and those who don't. And I'm saying that the government could actually affect change significantly in that and allay the fears of many, many people across the country who do have real fears here. And, and if, the, if the government doesn't understand that, the next question I would say is that the government needs to engage with people, they need to consult with people, and they need to listen to people. And that's the other part of this debate that the government are failing on. Because okay, well, I, want to, I want to stick, I want to stick with the system because that's a very strong, straightforward point that Pather makes, that the system cannot differentiate between people who need help, Barry, and those who do not. The system does. I mean, the international protection system is designed to identify people who qualify for international protection. They are people who are persecuted or discriminated against because of religion, ethnicity, um, sexual orientation, whatever it might be. So a, there is a set of rules, a set of criteria that are examined by the International Protection Office. So when people come in, that is the basis of their application. Now, I, I don't know if Pat has gone beyond that and saying that there's some people who are, are needier than others. And that's undoubtedly true. If you're coming from a war-torn area, you might be suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. You might you might be injured. You, there are all kinds of other things. You might be a victim of all kinds of heinous crimes. In actual fact, in my own experience, for example, in Black Rock, where, where a number of international protection applicants have arrived, there is on-site counselling for those people there. That's just one example. But it's not the case. I mean, Pat had talked about compassion. That is the system is based on the fact that we not only have obligations, but we want to accommodate people. I, I want to ask you about the documentation issue. We got that figure again from Daniel that 70% of people who are applying for asylum don't have their, their documents. What is going on there, Father? Yeah, so the, the, this is, it is an incredible situation. And, and I think there's about 3,500 people came through Dublin last year, Dublin Airport, uh, without uh, their, traffic, uh, their travel documentation. Now, I do understand that there are some occasions where people living in Afghanistan or Syria won't be able to collect their documentation before they leave their home country, uh, etc. Um, but we do also know that anybody getting onto a plane from another European country has to have tra travel documents to get onto the plane and come to Ireland. And if a person is, is, is losing purposefully, their travel documents are damaging, the travel documents are coming in on, on fake travel documents, that's a problem that we need to fix. And Barry, what is going on there, do you think? Yeah, I, I think that is a fair criticism. There are no direct flights from Syria or Afghanistan. Um, so the reality is that the vast majority of people arriving to Dublin Airport are coming from another European Union state or another safe country. Um, people who destroy their documents, and by the way, those figures that Daniel's mentioned also include people who have identifiably false documents. So it's not necessarily people who have So in that instance, for example, you can get on a plane in Paris or Frankfurt or Amsterdam with a false passport. The airline authority there is not going to understand that it's a false passport. It'll be identified when you get to Dublin. Those people are included in the figures. But whatever the case is, if you arrive here seeking international protection, you must establish your identity. You cannot be granted leave to remain here until the authorities are satisfied as to your identity. So the people who are coming here and either destroying documents or false
also find their identity need to understand that they're actually making the process of themselves more difficult and more prolonged. And that is a problem. It absolutely needs to be dealt with. And it's, it's not tolerated. Final point. I think that's the key point. That I think some people are damaging their documents, losing their documents, to prolong the process that they're here in Ireland. And there should be a penalty for a person who purposefully tries to to uh, damage travel Try and documents. prove that. Try and prove that. Well, it, like what I'm saying is that if we have a penalty to ha against something, its its purpose of the penalty is to, to inhibit people actually carrying out... In order out. to impose the penalty, you've got to prove that somebody purposefully destroyed their documents. Well, How are you going to do that? Well, if a person's coming into the country and got onto a plane with documents and has no longer a document at the end, we know that they have lost the travel document. And there should be a penalty for that. But purposefully is the key word there. The, the, the key, but the, first of all, in 2002, the Guardian issued over, I think, close to a thousand carrier penalties for people who didn't have documents they arrived here. So there's a, there's a dual way to approach that. But there is already a penalty in place in real terms for people because, uh, first of all, the prolongation of their application is not a pleasant thing for them, whether they think it is okay. or not. But they are disadvantaged right. in terms of seeking protection. We, we are going to have to leave that there. But thank you both for coming in, Padre Tobin.